Hey, Fugland, today's show is great. I'm glad you came over to the YouTube. There's a couple special moments in this show, but we're talking about the NFC West, a great conference for fantasy football. You've got the doldrums of the Arizona Cardinals and them getting a little bit faster. You've got the Todd Gurley saga. There's a lot of great information we're looking at. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Stay tuned. This is Hall of Fame of Marshall Falk, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Always good to be around these parts. The announcer was partially correct because today... We are coming to you from a meat locker because our last show produced Got a real Goldilocks situation going yeah, on in we here. Were, <laughs> our last show, like we're we're in the deserts of Arizona, it can be very hot. And Brooks thought we would lean into that for for Tuesday's show, and he put us in a sweat lodge where J- I, Jason made four notes on his <laughs> board throughout the show. You know, we have this uh, board to take important right. notes, very important uh, player stuff. To, you know, and and the, my only notes that I could write down through the show was something like "hot." It's so hot. I'm so hot. I yeah. had to be cut away from my leather seat. Yeah, they've been completely replaced. Mike and now he's just like, "Well, fine, Mister Fancy Pants. Deal with this subthermal temperatures. The Yetis are out in force." <laughs> <laughs> no, it's difficult in Arizona. It's 115 today, and you got to pre-cool our studio. But you know, it's blowing. Mike is sitting right in the in the vortex. Yes, I'm, you I'm, gonna be all right. I'm, I'll power through. Well, your takes are normally quite cold. <gasps> Very fair. Yes. Very fair. If if you hear chattering or clicking, that's just my teeth. All right. Fear not. You just thought you'd wait for the show to start to put bricks <laughs> not, on blast. Now your audio system. Do not adjust. All right. We have the NFC West on the show today, the divisional breakdown. We appreciate each and every one of you listening wherever, whenever you're listening. Thank you for the reviews, the subscriptions on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, on Spotify, ad-free on Stitcher Premium. Wherever you're listening, we appreciate you. And um, we do still have a giveaway right now, the Pat Mahomes signed jersey. We haven't given it away yet. Not yet. It is being kept uh, in, under lock and key. Well, you've seen uh, National Treasure, like the, the what they had to go through to get the Declaration of Independence. I have not seen that movie. but You I, haven't seen that? That movie is a National Treasure. I don't know if you're right about that. It's great. It's Nicolas Nick Cage, Cage is a starring actor of that film. It's Nick Cage. It's very uh, pulp. What, what's the, the pulp comics? Very Indiana Jones inspired. Are you, you're a big fan. It's great. All right. Today is Thursday, July 18th. Here's the quick question for today's episode of the Fantasy Footballers. Name a player or situation that you believe you'll be annoyed to talk about throughout the upcoming season. This happens every year. I would say last offseason, we were very annoyed to constantly be talking about Ezekiel Elliott's suspension and concerns about those things. Maybe this offseason, it's been Tyreek or some of those uh, player arguments we've yeah. been in. Well, during season, but this last is, year was Lev. When's he coming back? Right. Every freaking week. When's right. he coming back? Yeah. Does that mean that in season this year is going to be Melvin Gordon? It could be. Mm-hmm. No. It could yeah, be. We'll, we'll I, see. Some of my people that I've been talking to have told me, he may play football this year. <laughs> but for what team? Excellent. All right, I'll, I'll lead it off here. The player that I uh, am going to be annoyed talking about is Leonard Fournette because I don't enjoy doing the whole injury prediction thing. And I feel like that's really the analysis that matters the most when it comes to Leonard Fournette. Say what you will about his efficiency or his inefficiency, but he, he You don't has- want to talk about him actually – Maybe he's not that good. No, well, no, because for fantasy football, he has been that good. For fantasy football, we've seen him as a top 10 back before. He gets enough volume. So I don't care if he's efficient at getting his fantasy points so long as he gets his fantasy points. But he's such 
you know, one of these guys that he's he's missed a game with suspension. He's missed games with injury. He's you think all, he's going to pop up on the injury report with something little every week, and you'll be going, oh, is he going to play? Yeah, and then if he does. But, you know, I also take this as this – this upcoming draft season that we're about to enjoy for fantasy football. And during that draft season, I hate talking about Leonard Fournette because it's like, look, if I knew he was going to play his full set of snaps for 16 games, I good. think he's actually, he's going to be a huge volume back. He's going to get enough work to matter for fantasy. and He'll be a good player, but I don't believe he plays 16 games. What I forgot about Fournette, I, I, I knew he's been a sub 4.0 guy. His rookie year, it was at 3.9. He had a 90-yard rush. I totally forgot about it. So, so he padded his numbers with one rush for 90 yards and still could not surpass the 4.0. That's, that's a feat. When I brought his name up with the James Conner discussions we had at the live show, it was in the context of he started so on fire in his one great season where you said he finished the top 10 back. That has been in, emblazoned on fantasy owners' brains since that time at what his potential is. And so if you're dealing with injuries with him or an offense we're not sure about, there was no offense worse in football in terms of touchdowns, the amount of drives per touchdown. You, we talk about how bad the Cardinals were last year and t total points per game. They were still better than the Jacksonville Jaguars Impossible. in terms of – I think it took them 8.2 drives – per touchdown last year. <laughs> nice. And if you want perspective on that, the uh I do. The Rams, 3.3 uh -huh. drives per touchdown. Mm. So it was not easy better. sledding. Nick Foles is the answer, right? Well, I've no. Okay. I think I'm going to be annoyed to talk about Kenyon Drake because I think I'm going to end up in a situation where frequently maybe once out of every 3 to 4 weeks Jason is going to come in here, six shooters uh, drawn, <laughs> firing into the air with an incredible Kenyon Drake like week. Yosemite Sam. Just <laughs> pew, 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 pew. Did you see that? And then I'm going to say, yeah, I saw it, and I'm going to be really annoyed about your victory lap. And then, the ne and then a couple weeks are going to go by again. And, and then we I'm gonna won't get mention it those weeks. We won't mention those weeks, and we'll be back. So I think he'll be annoying because I just don't know what's going to happen in Miami. They had the worst odds for the uh, – for a Super Bowl celebration this year, right. three hundred to one on yesterday's uh, or on Tuesday's show. All right, I'm, I'm not going to get into it too much right here in the quick question because we are in fact covering this team. We were breaking down the NFC West, but my answer is Seattle. I think it's going to be uh, a tough. That's fantasy. interesting. It's going to be a tough fantasy situation, and it, with between the running backs, Russell Wilson, we're going to be talking about some touchdown regression. Tyler Lockett. We'll probably talk about some touchdown regression. Things are just wild up there in Seattle. There will be there will be points. That's the problem. There there will be fantasy points up there, but it's gonna be it's gonna be uh, obnoxious. If we talk about it during the season, I won't be annoyed if we talk about this guy. <laughs> we won't. We won't be talking. We won't be talking about. Will, look, we will be talking about it, Will Disley. We'll, it we'll will bring be, it up. Be, it was such a feel-good story. If this guy can come back from that injury, I just we'll talk is, about it today. That's we a never tell me Seattle. the odds. By the way, on yesterday or on Tuesday's show, Jason, I think you brought up: Has there ever been a 27-year-old breakout running back? Someone pointed out to me: Michael Turner. The year when ah, he came over from the uh, Chargers to Atlanta, he broke out at 27. He was a superstar in Atlanta's offense, so How it can old happen. That has been done before. Hold on. But now that I'm actually thinking about it, how old was the depth chart assassin himself, Mr. Fred Jackson? I mean, he, was, he was like 33 when he broke out. It was very late. That's yeah, hyperbolic, I, but it was very late. Yeah, Fred Jackson. I think Fred Jackson just had one of those prolonged uh, – successful yeah. interim parts I, of I his career. I think the big difference between Michael Turner and Damian Williams is that when Michael Turner was behind LaDainian Tomlinson, everybody said, this guy's going to be special when he gets his chance, and then he went and was special, whereas while Damian Williams has been behind everybody, well, I feel they've like been you, like... I think Fred Jackson was 28 when he had his breakout Yeah, that campaign. makes sense. I, I feel like you have to give Damian Williams a break and obviously you have, have in your rankings but the reason I say that is because 
the same coach that you bemoan frequently for stifling the talent of Kenyon Drake was responsible for the snap counts for Damian Williams. Therefore, maybe he just doesn't know what he's got. Sure. I mean, uh, th that's fair. Um, I'm talking about Mr. B-Hole. <laughs> <laughs> you remember? I do yes, remember. I do remember. I do remember. All right. A quick reminder, ultimatedraftkit.com. A dollar of every UDK sold goes directly to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, our partners this offseason. If you need some help getting ready for your draft, check that out at ultimatedraftkit.com. Uh, we are going to get into some news. News and notes from around the league. Presented by Sleeper. All right, so before we jump into the NFC West, a little follow-up from Tuesday's show. Yahoo's Charles Robinson says, Zeke has to report by August 6th in order to receive an accrued season towards free agency, Mike. Yes, this goes to speak will be to there. some of the things that you said. This is more blustery. You have a lot less control in this situation, right? Uh, yeah, he's, he's under contract for two more years, which it's pretty rare for an NFL team to start negotiating you with, with, with you at that point. Point and he so he has to be there or he's going to be in big trouble for his further contract negotiations. The Titans uh, official website expects Delaney Walker to be ready for week one. I hate hearing stuff like that. I just I mm. I'm just throwing this out there. Like I mean that's good. You want him there for week one, but when week one is the is the expectation and it's not play, it's not preseason, it's not training camp. It's like. He's not going to be ready for that, but don't worry. Don't worry. We won't miss any real games. At the very least, from a fantasy perspective, you know, that, that, that's the Baldwin style. Like, he's not going to be ready till week one. But if he's not, you know, that's just an arbitrary date that they're picking because the games count then, not because that's the date that his injury should be healed by. Well, and it's ironic because Joni Smith, who had the opportunity after Delaney Walker, hurt himself. He's not expected to be ready by week one. He's questionable. Walker could, if he's active, just walk into a great role. Nice <laughs> one. Uh, <laughs> how, much, how much training camp and preseason would Delaney Walker zero. actually participate in? Oh, I thought you were saying, does he need? And it's no, zero. Yeah, that's what, yeah. he needs zero. I think if he, was for, if he was fully healthy, they would be getting him in shape, which I would prefer to hear about that but he's not going to take very many actual live snaps the tight end landscape in fantasy is rough that's why we talk about chris herndon's suspension length nobody has him at the top of the list but it's rough you need options so it's interesting yep two follow-ups on the tuesday show we talked about the afc west talked about the denver broncos and um a couple bits of news came out since then if you haven't heard that show go back download listen to it a lot of breakdown of, of, of the Broncos and that whole division. Speaking Wednesday, Emmanuel Sanders says he's definitely not going to be full go from the jump in training camp. He's going to be a monitor situation. I don't think anybody expects him to be 100% when camp begins. Jason, you brought this up. It's going to be a process. But uh, he says he's not going to be ready to go from the jump. And then the Denver Post suggested that Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman will form a 50-50 timeshare this season, mm. noting that Lindsay hasn't run a single play in front of the new coaching staff. We already knew that. And that Freeman, Royce Freeman, has hogged first-team reps because, of course, if Lindsay's not there, who would? But this is the whole point yeah. of the conversation this last six months with Philip Lindsay. And this, it's just the nature of humanity. The coaches can go back and watch what Philip Lindsay did on tape last year, but this is happening right in front of them right now. It's their scheme. If, if, if Lindsey doesn't get in there soon, how is it not anything but a 50-50 as, as an undrafted player who doesn't have the draft capital, the money being paid to him, forcing the issue to get the carries, la it was last offseason, it was last training camp where Philip Lindsey really showed the, the coaching staff, wow, there's something special here. So, yeah. If wow. They, if, wow. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Wow. So if if you know if that's not, I'm not happening, even sure what's being referenced right now. Well, I the think last I was one going was, walking. You were that's going where walking. I was going. I that was shuffling. walking. That was I thought you were doing the room. If I you go back I uh, I'm to not, Hamilton, first of all, I'm not doing it again. Second of all, <laughs> it's if you go tape. back to the original tape, you'll hear him. I thought I was walking. Thank you. I thought. Oh. Thank I you, Brooks. I thought it was was it Tommy Wuzo or you whatever. You guys just followed up so fast it distorted how great the first one. Oh hi, Mark. Wow. <laughs> yeah, see, that's what I thought you were doing. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, 
We'll monitor. We'll see what happens. We'll monitor Andy's the impersonations. Situa- Again, any of these conversations around Lindsay are not an indictment on the talent, the ability, and what he brings to the table. This is a fantasy football show. The breakdown for this team, it's going to be better off with Freeman and Lindsay both being involved. And if we thought Freeman was a bum, we would be fine with Lindsay just stealing every snap away. I don't think Freeman's a bum. So 50-50 is what I'm expecting. Lindsay's probably going to keep dropping, though. Yesterday his ADP was 408. Okay. If you think he's going to score more fantasy points than Royce Freeman, 408 versus 801 or whatever Freeman's going at, Lindsay's still a steal there. Yeah, if it is 50-50, that doesn't mean that they have the same fantasy points, just the same opportunity. Good point. Philip Lindsay is is the more explosive player yes. we saw last year. He's he's going to, on a per-touch basis, outscore Royce. All right, check out the Sleeper app. Not just the best breaking news, but the best platform for modern fantasy players in general. Download the Sleeper app today. We thank them for sponsoring our news segment. And let's go ahead and get into it. Let's get divisional. All right, we're talking through the NFC West. We're breaking it down. Last year, the Rams 13 and 3, the Seahawks battled their way to 10 and 6. The 49ers were 4 and 12, the Cardinals were 3 and 13. Cardinals did the mirror of the Rams record last year. We're very proud of the it black out here mirror. in the desert. Yes, the black mirror. It's no good. No. So, let's go ahead and get into this oh! offense. It's Jerry. Now, now Mike, it's, it's my new best friend. Oh, that's right. Jared Garf. Mike, you had a chance to uh, snap a snap a photo on the red carpet I, at the ESPYs. With, I did. With and your pink uh, your pink outfit. Uh, yeah, my, it was, my pink outfit was sensational. Jared Goff was very impressed with it. Who are you wearing again? <laughs> <laughs> Amazon. So, <laughs> uh, and in, look, I, I had to take the opportunity. I'm talking to Jared Goff. I'm talking to the, the quarterback uh, of Todd Gurley's team. And I had, took that chance to ask him about Todd Gurley. I said, all right, Jared, how's the knee doing? There's nothing more. Hold on. Hold on. There's nothing more condescending than him not being the quarterback of the Rams, but being the quarterback of Todd Gurley's team. Well, it's, as look, his, like, no, he's moniker. the quarterback of the Rams, but I'm saying. No, I know what you meant. He yeah. is. He is, should be good friends with Todd Gurley. Uh, and I said, how's the knee, Jared? And he kind of had a, a sheepish smile on his face and he said he said it's good man I just, I just took him fifth overall in my fantasy draft and I said yeah but Jared how's his knee doing <laughs> and he just kept saying good this his answer to a lot of things was good mm. and then I asked about Daryl Henderson how is the rookie acclimating to the system good I said okay well how's Daryl Henderson's pass protection that's when his face broke that's when the smile kind of grew to the Un, from sheepish, you know, I'm just answering questions to an uncomfortable. Ooh. I gotta, I gotta maintain. It's, it's good. Followed up quickly by uh, him saying, "I gotta get out of here before I say something I'm not allowed to say." So take that for what you will. First hand account of me speaking with with Mr. Garf with now, King Goffrey. Now King Goffrey took. Gurley at five, he said. Now, was that a Rams-only draft? Would he have gone <laughs> no. at five in a Rams-only no. draft? But but I did ask. I said. I said, how much money is on the line for this one? And he said, it's actually none, which counterintuitively actually spoke more to me that maybe he does believe Gurley's going to be okay because Jared Goff doesn't need to win money. If he's in a league with his friends and this is pride on the line, uh, it's well, tough. It's tough. Look, this team, one of the best in football on offense last year, third in rushing yards per game, fifth in passing yards per game, brought it up earlier. They scored a touchdown every 3.3 drives. This is one of the only teams in football where we ask the question, can they sustain three top 20 wide receivers and an elite running back and an elite quarterback? Yep. This offense isn't really changing at all. That is, we've talked about the Chargers being kind of a stabilizing, stabilizing force right. in the AFC West and the NFC West. Look, this is the same offense, the same players. It's Brandon Cooks, Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, Josh Reynolds, Gerald Everett and Higby, Gurley, right? You lose C.J. Anderson, you draft Daryl Henderson, and it's all the same. There's no 
absence of the same players that made this offense great a year ago, that stability generally lends itself towards uh, expectation, uh, a certainty that that production will happen again, right? Yeah, it does. And and when you combine that with a great offensive mind like Sean McVay, I think we can confident. I mean, you know, most people look at this season and say the Rams are going to have a really good offense. I think that that's yeah. a you know an obvious bet. They will have a great offense. I think they're going to have a great running back uh, production, regardless of who it is. I mean, a la C.J. Anderson, week 14 and 15, or 15 and 16 last year, winning people championships, rolling off 20 carries, 23 carries for 167, 132 yards. Whoever the running back is is going to be great. The, the question is, is it going to be Todd Gurley? With Todd Gurley or without Todd Gurley, the Rams are going to be great. Like, I don't have fears of, okay, if Todd Gurley, his knee starts acting up and they can only get him, you know, 10 carries a game, if that, is this going to hurt the Rams' offense? No, we've seen it. We saw them. I mean, they here's their points when, when Gurley was, was out. They scored 31, 48, uh, 30, 23. Like, they, they're putting up points. So that means the wide receiver cores and Goff himself, to me, are where the real value is on this team. There are some question marks. If you look at last season like a boxing match, the majority of the season, the Rams were just smooth, moving around the ring. Everything came easy to them. But what the fans got to see last was a punch in the mouth. Three was them points. getting caught by Belichick in the Super Bowl, I think we understand that that was, look, it's one game. Gurley on the sideline a lot towards the end of the season. Cooper Cup wasn't a part of the active roster at that point in the season. I still don't know if I believe that this team can is the same without Gurley that it is with Gurley um, over the course of an entire season. It's one thing to say, hey, a guy with fresh lace can come in into an offense that's moving and doing what it's doing. Uh, I obviously expect them to be a great offense. They also, those three wide receivers, they're out on the field all the time together. They, right. They're never, they're pretty much out there 70-plus percent of the time. They run 11 personnel more than anybody in football. So you're not really having to pick and choose who's going to be the starter and who's not going to be out on the field, right? Yeah, and, and I believe all three are of value right now. As crazy as that sounds, I want any one of those three wide receivers. So can I give you their ADP? Yes. In, as you continue, Cooks is 406, Woods 409, Cup 503. That's just awesome. I mean, that's awesome. Those are three consistent, high-producing wide receivers. It's weird that they're on the same team. People are worried about the girly and the effects of what that happens to the Rams. I'm worried about that's the why ACL. Sure. Talk, with, talk with, to me about Cooper Cup. Are you really taking him at 503? At, in the fifth round, uh, I've, I've seen him drop way later than that as well. In the fifth round, I think it's it's an interesting conversation because there's other guys in that round that are also valuable. But he's, I mean, he was the number one, right? When healthy, Cooper Cup Because was, he's, he's the touchdown guy. Exactly. He is the, the, the big red zone threat for them. He's got a great rapport with Goff. Yeah. And a small caveat there, like he's not the number one by design in their offense. You're talking from a fantasy perspective. From a fantasy yeah. perspective, because of the red zone work, uh, Goff was the guy who was going to lead the way. Who would you say is the number one? Would you say that's Cooks I think, or uh, Woods? Because I would it's say Brandon, Woods. It's Brandon Cooks to me, for sure. Hmm. Um, by the way, Cup was the wide receiver two in fantasy through the first five weeks of last year, speaking to your point from a fantasy production standpoint. From the ultimate draft kit, Matthew Betts, who gives the injury notes for the ultimate draft kit, says once training camp kicks off, Cup will be nine months from surgery. So he has a chance to be ready for week one. He doesn't expect him to be able to produce at that level until halfway through the year at the at the kind of level you saw last year. Right. Um, Mike, you know, when you talk about Brandon Cooks, I mean, any he's been Mr. Consistent. He's not going to be a top five finisher, but I don't think any of these three are going to be a top five finisher. Yeah, and – I I I'm not sure which way I lean between Brandon Cooks and Robert Woods. Who's the the one on the team? I it's I don't Woods. even I don't even think the team looks at it that way. They're just they play different roles in the offense. But between the two of them, I would rather have Robert Woods. I I want the more consistent guy. I know that Cooks has the ceiling that Robert Woods doesn't have. Every once in a while to explode, but Robert Woods is just. He, yeah, a, he is reliable, man. He will not let your team down. On an individual game, 
if they were both going to have just a monster, their best game, Cooks's ceiling is higher. But on the season, I don't think Cooks's ceiling is any higher than Woods. And Woods is so much more consistent. In an offense like that, you want the targets, right? I mean, last year, both played 16 games. You had 130 targets to Robert Woods, 117 targets to Brandon Cooks. The consistency rating of Robert Woods is a guy who you don't draft as your number one, even your number two wide receiver. You could get him as your third if you if you started with a stud back and went three wide receivers. And he is as consistent as they come. They're both – I mean – it's kind of a weird situation. You're not playing the value game with them. They're drafted about no, the same No, you're picking spot. which one you want unless you are just they, picking up even the like total scraps. end of season production is almost identical. 80 receptions versus 86. 1204 versus 1219. 5 and 6 touchdowns. So you are is there any situation where you want Cooks over Woods? In no. your mind, Jason, no, because of the none you be always want the consistency, but you're not going to get the top end games from Woods as often. Right. If 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 you look at their two, you know, go to go to the ultimate draft kit. Look at the 2018 consistency charts on a week in week basis. It's a really easy way to 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 visualize these players. You go, okay, they both finished about the same, same similar stat lines. Both great players, but one was just every single week helping your team, and the other had his big weeks, and then had his bad weeks. Ask yourself, do you want Amari Cooper? You know, and, uh, and obviously Cooks is not to that degree of right. of hot and cold, but that's where if they're, if those guys are going next to each other and they're going to both finish great, but one is going to be the more consistent first read target for golf, that's the guy I want. And Robert Woods is just disrespected, man. He's great. Yeah, I mean – I. I don't know. Isn't he going higher than the other two wide receivers? Didn't you just say no, that? No, Cooks is three three points higher, three spots. And also – Right, than the other two guys. Yes, oh. Cooks. Oh, you said Cooks. Is yes, Cook, yes. Three spots higher going, than Woods. It's going Cooks, Woods, Cup. Yeah. I don't – you still got a chip on your shoulder for Woods. I've got a but big they have, chip I mean, on my shoulder for Woods. At least he's not getting drafted two rounds behind the other right. two guys. No, Cook, he's getting two, drafted two rounds behind where he's going to finish. Well, that, that you could be right about. In 2015, Cooks was 14th. 2016th, he was 9th, then he was 12th, then he was 13th. He's going to be in that range, which is like not really the one you want for your team. Right. Right. And, and, but a uh, wonderful two. An interesting little nugget here I wanted to bring up about the running backs and, and Todd Gurley. Like This is not to take away from Todd Gurley, the player. I think as far as running backs go, he is among the elites in the league right now. But we've talked about frequently the, the, the NFL next-gen stats. Running backs, how often do they face eight defenders in the box? You know, talking about how Royce Freeman had the, the second highest percentage of his runs uh, at 36%. You know where Todd Gurley is on this list? He's got to be at the bottom. Third fewest. Of course. You because can't. Because 8.2% of the time they're able to stack the box against Todd Gurley, which is why – they can be so – if you can't say we're selling out to stop Todd Gurley, then they're not going to sell out to stop Daryl Henderson or whoever is in there. The, C.J. So, Anderson so went the, off. Just You're saying, saying it's a very comfortable situation so for Rams, any running back. Yes, Rams running back, regardless of who it is, will put up real fantasy points. I, I was reading this morning the Rams had – they had a first down on 35% of their plays, like on first downs. So they – produce you know they're passing the ball on first down all the time you can't stack the box against Gurley it's a good point yeah it's it's play design it's Sean McVay is right. a better offensive coach than you wrap it around to finish the Rams Gerald Everett any chance to break out this season at N tight end no um yes minimal well I want you to weigh in here since we were split no I don't think so. Not that with the correct. offense being exactly the same. Not with 1.4% vacated targets, which we believe is probably all of the targets that went to C.J. Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it, no team has a more consistent target expectation than the Rams going into the new year. Uh, offensive line supposed to be they'll ranked be, they'll number be elite. six they'll be elite. by the huddle. So let's talk about the Seattle Seahawks. <sighs> Go Hawks! Yes, uh, the Seahawks, 10-6 and six last season. I want to emphasize this is a running football team. You know it, but do you know it the way these numbers know if it? If you don't know, now, now you, you know. know. All right, the Seahawks last season, 2,092 rushing yards. Mind you, that is running backs. That is not rolling Russell Wilson into it. The Rams, 
The 49ers, the Saints, and Broncos were behind them. They ran for 160 yards per game. 130 was the running back, so 30 of that was Russell. This team wants to run, run, run some more. There is more than enough opportunity for multiple running backs to have top-tier fantasy value. Yeah, Chris I mean, Carson, Rashad Penny, we want to split them up. Mentally, we want to pick a favorite. Maybe the answer is both. Yeah, it very well could be both. When I was doing my rankings at the beginning of the season uh, or the beginning of the, the off season. I, I took a look, you know, we, I, we're not putting players in order. We're actually statting out the entire team and looking at all their matchups and everything. And, and at the end, I looked at where I had these guys in my rankings, and I was shocked that I had them, Chris Carson and Rashad Penny, back to back as far mm -hmm. as their finish on the season. Because while I still give the, the lion's share to Chris Carson, who, if you don't remember how, mu how much he got the ball when he was healthy, he would have topped Zeke on total carries uh, you know if, if he played a full 16 games so he's going to have the lion's share there but on a pass catching basis I think Rashad Penny has the skills to do that you have Mike Davis Mike Davis last year had 42 targets 112 rushing attempts those are gone and you have Chris Carson with a current injury and an injury history so I, I think both backs are good picks. I'd be happy to scoop up Chris Carson and hope I've got, you know, a lead dog and I'd be happy to scoop up Rashad Penny and say I've I've got a pass catching option who's a weekly start and if if Chris Carson goes down, which we've seen him do several times, could be a league winner. Would you rather in the 4th round though, knowing that you like both of these guys. There's there currently is a two round difference between Chris Carson and Rashad Penny. They're both going at the back of their respective rounds, 4th round, 6th round. Would you rather take somebody else in that fourth round that 100%. you really like and then just reach a round? Yes, I it, it, I would. Whoa, <laughs> now. I had my face perked up. Oh, you got to go to YouTube for that one. Um, the YouTube on that one is so special. What, right Mike now, YouTube.com slash the willing, fantasy footballers. He wants to know if you're willing to reach a round. <laughs> uh, Are um, you willing to reach a round? Let it undo. I am willing to... <laughs> I'm willing to reach two rounds, I would say, just to be safe. <laughs> just um, to be safe. So You are? Yeah, so no, uh, no, 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 no. One. I reach. just had to <laughs> – this is all just wordsmith here. Here's the reality. So, like, I, I say Chris Carson could be a value. He certainly could be a value in the fourth. That being said, other great players are in the fourth round. I mean, we just talked about some of those wide receivers – <laughs> that are in the fourth round. Yeah. I mean, you tell me if Robert Woods and Chris Carson are there, I'm going Robert Woods all day. Two rounds later at the back of the sixth to be able to get Rashad Penny, I'm very happy to do that. But it's a roster construction thing, right? If you start with wide receivers, I think in the fourth round, Chris Carson isn't necessarily a bad pick is my point. There, okay. was no, there were no other running backs in football that finished three consecutive weeks to end the year in the top seven, and that's what Chris Carson did at the end of last year. And thank goodness for it. That was like a deposit that he's able to cash in on for my injury doubts or like concerns about being usurped. I'm thankful that he was so good to finish the year so that I could have confidence in him. I think both players are going to be very valuable. I believe that Pete Carroll has a great trust in Chris Carson. Yes. And I think you're going to see both players with huge opportunities because obviously Pete Carroll invested in Penny in the top of the first round. Um, but let's talk about more of this offense. Seventeen percent vacated targets. Doug Baldwin yeah, retired. retired. Tyler Lockett. Hard oh, Lockett. DK Metcalf. David Moore. Jerron Brown. Will Disley. These are some of the pass catchers that could step up and take some of that. I'm concerned about predictability. I'm concerned that Mike will be 100% right from his quick question where we will be coming in and you will be chasing fantasy points yeah. in the passing game, maybe outside of Tyler Lockett. I think Tyler Lockett may be able to give you enough maybe. if they're moving him around in the formation. Doug Baldwin's not there. Lockett should be consistent to some degree. That might be saying Tyler Lockett's a wide receiver. Two, three fringe guy all year long. But from a consistency standpoint, he's the only one that I can, I think I can look at and get something out of. 504 is his draft spot right now. That's pretty high. It's it's high, but he is 
he is, uh, so, you know, look at reception perception for Tyler Lockett. Take the quarterback, take the passing offense out, even fantasy out, and just say, is he by himself a good wide receiver, an average, above average? He's great. He is actually a super talented wide receiver. He's got a super talented quarterback. He's got all the opportunity now that Doug Baldwin is completely out of the way. The only hardship here is that they don't throw the ball a lot. I am going to take the number one wide receiver for Russell Wilson, who is a great wide receiver. I'm not taking any of the other wide receivers. I'm sure DK Metcalf will have an awesome long bomb touchdown or two, but he, you know I've got to only rely on the number one guy. That's Tyler Lockett. I am. I know. I know you guys aren't as high as Lockett uh, as you're I. At, am. You're at wide receiver twenty right now. Yeah. Mike is at twenty two. I'm at twenty three. So we're not we're not burying him. He can win you a week. That is for sure. I mean, we saw last year, obviously, his, his touchdown numbers were out of Impossible. control. Yeah, it's not going to it's not gonna stick there. But he's he's been a guy that obviously has dealt with injuries in the past, was not the lead dog in the, in, in, on the team. And, you know, he's a 70-target guy in the past. I don't see him staying at 70 targets this year. That's the big question. Is where, where are you projecting his target volume to go? Because if, he, if he's used similarly – then he will be a but he will bust absolutely yeah if he if he ends up with 70 targets i agree that he will bust i've got him at 95 targets okay. right now we cannot leave the seahawks without talking about russell wilson mostly because jason you have him at qb5 i have him at qb8 and mike has him absolutely shellacked at yes. qb16 yes uh i have i've reached the point and i guess jason you have too we can talk and talk and talk about efficiency metrics and what's sustainable for a quarterback but at the end of the day, and this is something that any statistician, analytical person, you know, for me, when I look at numbers, it's hard for me not to look at the fact that every situation is unique. Russell Wilson is a, an efficient quarterback, period, end of sentence. He sure. will, that's what he is in the NFL. He is always going to be efficient. Uh, he's going to make the most of the attempts he has. He was one of the few players. I mean, he was a top 12 quarterback 62% of the time last year. There's only a handful of guys that could do that. I tend to just believe he's going to end up in that top 10 category again. I, I don't based, know which one of you guys want to, based to talk. On, but. Based on nothing but data, a historical modeling, looking at the average NFL quarterback, those things, Russell Wilson should suck this year. But Russell Wilson is great. His rookie year, he was the number 10 quarterback. He followed that up by being the number eight quarterback, the number three, the number three, the number 11, the number one quarterback in fantasy football last year, the number nine. He's just going to get the job done. That's my belief. Like at some point, I'm, I'm much more on Andy's side. At some point, you have to weigh both the analytics and the averages along with the, the specialty player. of like the player. It's like if Mahomes puts up six straight years of 40 or, or more, I'm just going to concede that he's a 40 or more guy. Sure, but that's a, that's a pretty large sample size. The problem with Russell Wilson is it's not just you're betting against, you're betting against regression, you're betting against the analytics, you're betting against historical, like very high-level history. Since the year 2000, there's been – Eight, only eight times that a quarterback with over 150 attempts has sustained that 8% touchdown rate. And I went through all of them. And where did they go to the next year? Peyton Manning drops 2%, 3%. The, the following years of, of his outrageous touchdown percent years. Nick Foles, his 2013 season was awesome. He dropped four. Who is the first name? Peyton Manning. Peyton. Yes, and he's the only one who he's on this list twice. So Nick Foles saw his pr touchdown percentage drop four percent. Tom Brady, technically, he saw his touchdown percent drop eight point seven percent, but that's because he's got he got hurt, and I won't hold that <laughs> against him. But in, in the the actual following up season to his his monster year, dropped nearly four points. Aaron Rodgers dropped two points. Deshaun Watson dropped four points. Those those are the times. The only other times that people have. Have uh, had that eight percent touchdown rate in their following season. Can I, uh, aside from Patrick Mahomes, because we don't have data on I, him, I'm not going to dispute the data, but can you concede the fact that based on his historical finishes, Russell Wilson has the ability because he has like three or four special skills. Like if he was a, a sure. video game character, he's got like three power ups. He can compensate for an off. You know, he, maybe he's not hyper efficient, 
but maybe he runs for another 150 this year mm-hmm. than he did right. last year. That's mm-hmm. where I look at him and I say, you know what? I'm just going to believe. Trust the player. That right. That he's going to end up in that. Because 16 would be the worst finish of his career by a great degree. Now, you're not saying he necessarily will finish there. You'll just draft 15 guys ahead of him. Yeah, and, and look, that last year what he did with, with the passing attempts that he actually had, you give him literally his his career touchdown percent, which is very high. What you're saying about Russell Wilson is true, but last year also bumped that up. So his career average is now 6%. Every 6% of his throws, he throws a touchdown. You give him that really inflated number. Last year, he would have been right around there, quarterback sure. 15, quarterback 16, and you wouldn't even be – People would be furious, and we would not even be talking about him. It, it's worth, but he put up a, a crazy outlier season. It's definitely worth bringing up for sure because, and I know we've talked at this at length, but the reality is while he's been since 2012 a quarterback one every single year since he's been in the league, last year was a, a switch yes. back to a different style of football, and that's the only year of data that we have with that that kind of target volume running the ball that much to that degree and that's when he had that super efficiency so a lot of variables out there that's where i trust the player all right rapid round close out question for the seahawks no is dk metcalf whatever going to be a fantasy is. value in any capacity this year are you going is he going to be started for Sus- fantasy teams more than 50 percent of the weeks no no okay the 49ers we need to talk about the 49ers last year it was a um well, it was a rotating Woof. door at quarterback. Kyle Shanahan, you know, he suffered the way that um, Gruden has suffered in Washington. Injuries at the running back position, at the quarterback position, at the, at wide, the wide receiver, receiver position. position. Yeah. Uh, you can be a genius, but if you don't have all the tools in your tool shed, it makes it more difficult. We'll see if he can get it done this year. Jimmy G coming back. Jimmy Hanslem, healthy. Matt Breida, Tevin Coleman, Jarek McKinnon, Jeff Wilson – and then like 46 other running backs in the fold in San Francisco. We'll try to wade through that a little bit. And then we've talked, I mean, we've talked quite a bit about the 49ers in general. George Kittle won a lot of leagues for people last year. Right now he's going in the third round of fantasy drafts towards the back half of it. Tevin Coleman, the big offseason addition at running back, one that we weren't expecting to happen but made sense because Kyle Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan has a history with Tevin Coleman from Atlanta. Jarek McKinnon coming back from injury. And then they just, like, replenished their wide receiver core outside of Dante Pettis coming back, who I know all of us really like the prognosis, the projection for Dante Pettis. But you got Debo Samuel in the second round. you got Jalen Hurd in the third round. And then Marquise Goodwin coming back from injury. So this is an offense where I think if you had to pick one word to describe it, potential. That's a great word. Yeah. It, it's – because it's all there. It's similar to see what I was talking about Seattle. There will be points. I think it's a, it's a little easier to navigate this, though, where, where they're going to go. We all really, really like Dante Pettis. I do want to start the conversation, though, with George Kittle because he's kind of the, the new hotness going at the back of the third round. He's the, currently the highest drafted player from San Francisco. I want to travel into the time machine a little bit. Last year, do you guys remember who the number two target was for the San Francisco 49ers? Over oh the course gosh. of the season? Total target volume over the course of the season. I'm going to guess Trent Taylor. <laughs> that's, that's not the worst guess, but that is not correct. The answer is Kendrick Bourne, <laughs> who had 66 targets compared to the number one target on the team, George Kittle, with 136 targets. That's not happening again. <laughs> Not with, not with Dante Pettis playing a full season and reloading at the wide receiver position for this draft, very specifically Debo Samuel, who's a sensational wide receiver. And, I, and then Mark, we don't even talk about Marquise Goodwin. I mean, he's, he's still, jumping off of elephants he's, catching footballs. He's he very healthy. He also just healthy. won the yeah, NFL's fast. fastest man competition, won a million dollars. That's really not fair that they have the Olympian sprinter <laughs> like – <laughs> that being said, if you're an Olympic sprinter playing football, probably should be mentioned as an advantage for Jimmy G and sure. company. It, are there enough weapons here healthy now, at least as of uh, this recording, to say, hey, Jimmy Garoppolo is in that sneaky upside category. He's there. Yeah, 100%. He's in the 12th round, which for a lot of leagues, he's going to go undrafted. And if you told me at the end of the year 
who's a guy that is a virtually undrafted quarterback who has the who has the potential not the you know I, I'm not saying that he is I think he's you know my quarterback 20 or something but he has the potential to come out here and end up as a top six quarterback he has the weapons he's had short stretches where he showed he could play almost 5,000 yard pace in his first season with right. San Francisco then the touchdowns came up on the pace of play last year if he puts those things together he could be a top end quarterback especially now that he's got the weapons that being said, I, I think he's one year away from taking that next major leap. Debo Samuel, still a rookie. Jalen Hurd, still, still a rookie. recovering from an ACL. He's still injury. recovering from an ACL. So, I, you know, I, 2020 San Francisco 49ers, I think, are great. But, uh, my I mean, my big win here on this team is just Dante Pettis. Foot Clan, keep him in the seventh round. Keep him low because I want him everywhere I can get him. I You know, he's one of those guys that. He's so good, and his opportunity is so good. I think he's going to hit. I think he's going to be great. We talked about this on the plane when we were going out to the live show, Jason. There is, There are only a few players in the NFL that on film to me, you see something that is Odell Beckham-like. Pettis is in that category for me. Mm -hmm. When you watch him play, he, he moves differently. He plays differently. You know, We talked about his maturing body. <laughs> Yes. Well, no, 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 unfortunately, no, no. Jimmy Garoppolo yeah, talked Jimmy about Garoppolo his did. maturing body. I'm going to bring up a player we haven't talked a lot about, and that's Jarek McKinnon. I find people, at least in the in the circles that I'm in, they either they either go the Tevin Coleman coming into a system he knows the free agent pickup. They either want to invest their the draft capital on Coleman, or they might have heard me talk about Matt Breida. They might have watched Matt Breida play football. They might side on the super value of the undrafted Matt Burita. But I don't hear a lot of people going, man, I'm targeting Jarek McKinnon in the ninth round. I mean, he's basically a ninth or tenth round pick, and he's ignored. He's like a ghost. It's because he he's not he is, back he is, yet. He is a ghost in the ninth round. But he probably – so you're saying it's because he's not back yet because you haven't seen him play. Exactly. If in preseason he gets the first snap, he's going to shoot – Yeah, you're right. – skyrocket up draft boards. This is just a matter of we haven't Do seen him. Do you expect him. that? I, right now, I guess that, but I, I, I wouldn't call it an expectation. I don't think you can really expect anything with these three running backs. We have to see something first. In preseason, this is going to be one of the teams to keep an eye on when it comes to that backfield. Just not, not how they do, not how they perform, just what's the order that you're giving them the ball? Who are you trusting first and second? All right, and we know that this offense, Kyle Shanahan wants to run the football, so it could be one of those things where if – it shakes out down to a couple guys. You might jump on it as a fantasy owner. Yes, but I want to see it first. They start on the road against Tampa, on the road against Cincy, then Pittsburgh in a bye week, just a heads up for the first few weeks of the season. Um, it, George Kittle, I guess, would be the last question I had to you from an ADP standpoint. I'm passing. 309, you're passing? Yeah, I mean, that's not to say he's not a great player. It's not to say he's not going to be the third best tight end in the league, but he's not going to – replicate what he did last year just like Mike brought up and he needs to do that in order to vindicate the draft price of giving up other really good players in the third round to grab a onesie position at tight end where you only need one you need multiple running backs you need multiple wide receivers you I'm, I'm not drafting Kittle in the third uh, among those other great options all right we're bringing it home boys we're talking about the Arizona Cardinals Last season, 3-13. and 13. Please wipe it from your memory. I've tried. Uh, it hasn't quite worked. I'm working on it. So has GM Steve Keim. He yes. has tried to delete it from the record books. What coach? What quarterback? <laughs> what draft picks? That year didn't happen. He should try to do... You know how like in collegiate sports... I was going to say it's like a you, vacated title. If, yeah, if you cheat, <laughs> if you cheat, you know, you pay some of those guys to come on your team... They will vacate your season. They will make your. They'll take your wins out of the record book. Can we just say we cheated our way to three and thirteen? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No more. I mean, talking about last year is really not going to help fantasy owners for the Arizona Cardinals. Outside of the fact that the offensive line stunk, that's going to be something that's brought up. But it's something that stink. Oh, yeah. Stink. It did that, too. Stunk. That one as well. It's going to be all of them this year, too. Yeah, I mean, the huddle has them ranked as the 29th best offensive line heading into the season. <laughs> Ooh, the 29th <laughs> nice. best. Optimistic. Classic. But the thing is, is 
a player like Kyler Murray who can get outside the pocket can mask some of those issues. Russell Wilson has played many years yes. behind one of the worst offensive lines anybody's ever laid eyes on. Um, improved last year, but he's dealt with that. So that it makes it a little easier to not pay attention to that. If we were coming into the season with Josh Rosen behind center and saying, oh my gosh, he needs pocket protection, which he didn't get last year, you know, it, it's a different story. But in, heading into this season, the offense has added a million pieces. Kyler Murray at quarterback, Andy Isabella, Hakeem Butler at wide receiver, Keyshawn Johnson in the sixth round at wide receiver. They basically... Cliff Kingsbury. Is Cliff Kingsbury, head coach. And Christian Kirk coming back from injury, a player that flashed in his rookie year. And obviously you still have David Johnson. David Johnson. Oh, it feels good. And then Larry <laughs> Fitzgerald, who came good. out today, talked about the pace of play. We've talked about it before. Cliff Kingsbury wants to run more plays than any coach in football. You can want what you want. If you never score, you never get first downs. It won't matter. But No, they're, I mean, the pace of play is everything. The pace of play, look, Chip yeah, Kelly. Big deal. The Chip Kelly uh, experiment for the Philadelphia Eagles, it failed. He flamed out. He got kicked out of the league, run out of Philly, except – his it fantasy. was really good for fantasy because <laughs> yeah, it, it was just run and gun and just play after play after play. They're getting these things off. There's 20 seconds left on the play clock, and they're like, snap the ball, go. And that's what is being talked about. That's what's being seen from the air, local, uh, from the players, from the beat writers. The pace of play is going to go from one of the slowest teams in the league to one of the fastest teams in the league, which means if the average draft price of Arizona Cardinals doesn't come up to meet it, there, there could be serious value here. Now, we've seen a lot of this come up. The David Chip Johnson, Kelly comp is the terrifying thing as a Cardinal fan. Sure. If, but NFL for fantasy wise, purposes, terrifying. you're right. So that's where it's like David Johnson's already done his leap, right? It, people have wised yeah, he up. Won't he's, go the f he's the fifth running back on average right now, I believe. And that's where he should be. And uh, I agree. Now with Melvin Gordon, I would, I would put him five before I would have put him six. Um, yeah, I mean, it, so D David Johnson is going to be great. But who can you really trust at wide receiver, considering they're looking at spreading it out three wide, four wide? You know, is Larry a value? Is Chris Well, let, is let's Kirk give some ADPs right out? now. Because right now, David Johnson, you said it, fifth, sixth player off the board. Christian Kirk, 706. Kyler Murray, 710, which, by the way, is a huge rise at ADP over yeah. the last few months. He, I think he was in the 12th, 13th round, people ignoring him. Now he's in the seventh round. Now he's like... People remember rushing quarterbacks do things in the NFL for fantasy. And then Fitzgerald's at 902. So J Jason, Mike, Kirk at 706 or Fitzgerald at 902 to capitalize on value in Arizona or take your shot at value in Arizona. I would take Larry Fitzgerald at 902 just because I think Christian Kirk has the higher ceiling, but it's more likely to me that Larry Fitzgerald has a better season and he's cheaper. I'm with you on that one. I think Man. Kirk is going to be – a good player. I think Isabella is going to have his weeks. I think both those players are going to get some of that. Uh, it's going to be hard to predict, but I would lean the Fitzgerald side. What about you, I, Mike? I have them pretty close to each other, but not ranked very highly. So with with them that close to each other, I would. Just would you take bypass the either? But both? Or I, would you I think him? I would. I think I would bypass them both at this point. I'm not excited. I mean, I have passed Larry Fitzgerald and Christian Kirk in. Numerous rounds of numerous drafts. I, I don't have a lot of stock in them. So if – sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just, you know, for, for what that's worth to the offense, that that does not mean that Kyler Murray – like people are always like, well, you don't have these wide receivers ranked high. How can the quarterback be high or vice versa? Happens all the time. I mean, we had a couple of years ago where, uh, you know, Kirk Cousins was, I think, a top five right. quarterback, and his highest ranked wide receiver was like 45 that can happen if you spread the ball around. You add the rushing for Kyler Murray. I don't think that you have to have a high wide receiver for Kyler to be successful for fantasy. It's, it's very easy because of how bad this offense was to kind of look at everything with a rosy tint of like, it's got to be at least a little bit better than where they're being drafted. To color in some of the challenges that you're bringing up, since 2004, rookie quarterbacks have failed to produce even one top 36 wide receiver 64% of the time. So more often than not, a rookie quarterback fails to produce high-level wide receiver play. Good example of what you could see. Different players, different offense. But Lamar Jackson was not good for the John Brown machine last year when he came in and took over. Um, Baker wasn't like, – yeah, you weren't, you weren't very happy with Cleveland's wide receivers last year. 
Yeah. However, uh, since 1990, every rookie quarterback that has crossed 80 total rushing attempts, which is only five attempts per game, has maintained a top 10 quarterback per game pace. Woo! Five a game? Five a game, and Kyler averaged 10 a game in college. That's yeah. easy money. And if you're calling – look, if you're going to be running that many plays, it's inevitable he's going to run the ball five to ten times a game. Yep. At minimal, which means it's inevitable that oh, Kyler man. Murray is worth – a late Sound seventh round pick of inevitability. So you can read more about the good, bad, and ugly of Kyler Murray. There's an article from Kyle Borgogan, oh, our editor in chief, the Kai Borg. Yeah, over. <laughs> <laughs> Who shortened that one? Was yes. that you, Brooks? Yes. Nice. You're yeah. rehired. What's his name again, Brooks? Who cares? No, no, no. I want Brooks to. Oh, pronounce it. Kyle Borg Borgnoni. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, the hiccup there was the best part because he was really Super trying to do a great to job. Start I don't with. think I've ever actually said it. It's, it's Borgnoni. <laughs> it's the Kai Borg. It's the Kai Borg. So he's got a great article. Kyler Murray, rookie quarterbacks and what history can tell us. It's up on the website, thefantasyfootballers.com. That breaks it down in more detail. It Star Trek is just the Borg, right? Right. Okay. Um, is there any other secret fantasy value you expect to see from this offense no. at the tight end position or with those rookie wide receivers? I was just going to bring up, I don't think Charles Clay or Ricky Seals-Jones are going to break out. I, it doesn't seem like the break system. Break down maybe, though? Uh, mm, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I think they're valuable for the team, but the, I don't see them breaking out. The only player that might be worth just mentioning, because Andy Isabella, Hakeem Butler, they get a lot of airtime uh, higher drafted rookies, but Keyshawn Johnson, you you dropped his name. I mean, if you're excited about He's a the good other player, if yes, you're he excited is. about the other two guys, he has every opportunity that those two guys have. I mean, I was, Andy is the opportunity kind of, of Butler and Chad yes. Williams is likely to be cut. By the way, out of Arizona, they're expecting Chad Williams not to make well, the roster. That's just based on talent and ability, right? I mean, and Kevin White is there. Oh the, yeah, the Kevin White <laughs> is there with an opportunity and uh, one last chance to to give it a go in Arizona. One so. last. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Pristine deal of the day. So, um, as we close this out, want to give you the pristine deal of the day. Jason is obsessed with Hamilton. Mm. He had the chance to see Hamilton in San Francisco, and now he's singing show tunes around the office. Yeah, you know it. Uh, pristine deal of the day: a Todd Gurley signed Los Angeles Rams jersey, sixty-seven dollars and fifty-seven cents yesterday at pristineauction.com. Go check out their daily sports memorabilia auctions. There's always a steal, always a deal. And, uh, yeah, use the code BALLERS when you sign up. Otherwise, that is it for today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for following along. But great news. We will see you one last time this week, Saturday. Yeah, that's There's right. There's a Saturday head show. Head-to-head mock draft, Mike. I'm coming for you. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.